So welcome, my name is John Lakos. I work at Bloomberg, and this talk is gonna be more of an economics talk than it is gonna be about a technical talk, although I'm sure technical issues will come up. And we are gonna talk about the advantages of having a software infrastructure that is what I will call allocator aware, and hence the talk. Copyright notice for people to enjoy. This is the abstract, but if you uh, are here, you don't need to see this, but for the people who are watching on video, you take a look at what's going on. Um, purpose of this talk, current state of affairs. Uh, we know that local allocators achieve performance. If anybody doubts that, this is not the right talk for you because I'm taking that as a given. Um, there are real world costs, and this is something that we haven't addressed before. There are real world costs associated with having allocator aware infrastructure. So we're going to admit that formally. Um, there are some important collateral benefits that have really nothing to do with performance, yet are extremely valuable in a large organization. And still there remain some concerns, and these concerns are in quotes because they are not real problems. They are concerns that people have when they're uh, not fully apprised of all of the details and such. So they are sometimes based on conjecture and other things. So what we're going to do today is present four allocator aware styles. And by present, I mean just mention them. Um, we're going to separate real from imagined concerns, discuss some important collateral benefits of being allocator aware, uh, address some common concerns, again, concerns around uh, allocator awareness, and then advocate for supporting allocator awareness for software infrastructure today, uh, and make a business case uh, using a detailed analogy. I have this analogy that I started out with and I like more and more as we go along. Then I'm gonna hint at something that's gonna make all of this almost moot, but we have to go through the exercise. All right, so introduction. Um, dynamic marital allocation is important. Uh, new and delete is usually adequate, but custom allocation is uh, sometimes advantageous. And sometimes it's absolutely necessary. And so when you absolutely need custom allocation, it doesn't matter, you will make it happen regardless of what's going on. But it's expensive to write your own data structures and achieve the, uh, this kind of uh, allocation. So we're motivated to provide allocator aware infrastructure today, even though we don't have any magic that makes it free. Then we're talking about something that I will allude to throughout the talk, but not even, come on in. Okay, that I will allude through throughout the throughout the talk, but not really talk about because that is something that's coming. Um, so there are two approaches to custom memory allocation. One of them is writing your own bespoke custom data structures when and as needed. Um, gives you the best possible performance. It has a high development and maintenance cost for people who want to use it. Um, we can build allocator aware components. Uh, nearly the best possible performance, not quite the best, but very, very good, much lower cost, has some collateral benefits. This is good. Um, now we're gonna talk about the airline analogy. And actually, you really need to understand allocators very well to understand this airline analogy at first, because it seems like the allocators are obvious and the airline analogy, not so much. But then when you start to go back and forth, it reinforces it. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you this idea First class, best possible, economy, cheapest possible, and this is from a client perspective. So if you're flying on an airplane and you have money to burn, what are you gonna do? You're gonna go economy? No, you're gonna go first class because that's what you do, right? But if you don't have money to burn and all you wanna do is get there, then you're gonna go economy. So these are kind of two options, and so we have economy and first class. Now obviously when they invented planes, they had one class, which is you get on the plane and you go. But then somebody said, wait, I can, I can make more money if I discriminate. This is price discrimination, classical price discrimination, please. And so we divide our service into first class and economy. But basically, everybody's going to the same place. We charge more for first class. Okay. So now we have this very interesting chart. So this is a mind experiment. Can't really do these things. But imagine if you owned a company and you had 6,200 people working for you that are doing software development, and you had a bunch of components that you wrote and dealt with. And, on, and, and this is a percentile. And on one end of the spectrum, 
there's the value you get by being able to use allocators in your software. And if you look at the set of components, you know, on this, at this end of the spectrum, you get no value at all. Because you can order them, right? You can order the components. These components, I get no value out of it at all. And these components, I get a lot of value. So this curve is a fictitious curve that gives you an idea of the shape. Does this make sense? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? I've got a bunch of components at my company and I've sorted them based on how important it is that I can use allocators to make things go faster or whatever. And I've sorted them like this. And there's, you know, there's some point here, you notice at first class, there's some point at which people would actually take the trouble to pay this enormous amount of money to do it. That point is right here. So if you're, I'm calling this alpha. If you're at the percentile that's above alpha, you're going to roll your own data structures and you're going to get the benefit, no matter how expensive it is, because you need it. That's, that's what you're going to do. So here's cost and effort, and these are different units. And so here's the cost, and here's the cost. At some point, there's very little cost to doing nothing. And then there's an enormous cost to doing everything. Do you see how it breaks down? And as soon as you get that enormous cost, you pick up the advantage of being able to use allocators here. Does this make sense? OK. So cost and benefit, right? You pay a cost, you get a benefit. Now, let's take the analogy a step further. Let's look at business class and premium economy. Here are two additional classes on an airline, and they compete with different uh, clientele. The, the almost as good as first class, that's what business class is, that's saying, I'm going to give you almost everything you need at a fraction of the price. And you say, heck, that makes sense. I like that. I'm going to go with that. And the other one is, suppose you don't have a lot of money at all, but somebody's willing to give you a heck of a lot more for just a little bit more money. You say, you know what? Maybe. So then you have now three different classes. You have the people that are, or in this case, four, but it's going to work out that we have three. Thank you. You have the people that want the cheapest possible thing. You want people that have the best possible thing. And then you have the people that want almost everything for almost nothing, which is most of us, right? OK. So I'm going to combine these two things into one service class. And I'm going to say that people below this alpha minus, they don't care. They're going economy regardless. They don't care how little you charge. They, they could care less. And then there's this alpha plus. They don't care how much it costs. You can give me everything. I want to spend the money anyway. I want the absolute best I can get, and I will handcraft it, and it, it doesn't matter. So this, this region in here, if you look at this, maps to what I'm going to call upper class. And this upper class is the region where you pay a little bit more and you get almost everything you want. And I'm saying from a client perspective. Keep in mind that this is from the client perspective, not from the company perspective. Who is the client? The client is the application developers. Who are the people that are paying for this extra effort who are doing the, the software infrastructure? The infrastructure developers. Now, in most companies, the application developers are the ones that get all the glory, make all the money, and are the heroes, and the infrastructure developers are the people that just sit there and work really hard, keep their heads down, and they make the company successful. They're just kind of like different, you know, different reward situations. Premium economy is that region to the left of, of alpha that says, well, if I get it for almost nothing, I'll use it, but I'm not really that excited. And the business class on the right says, well, I was going to spend the money anyway. So I'm getting it for a song. I am so excited, I can't stand it, right? But you get both. You get both of these things. Then if you look at cost here, again, you pick up the cost here, and you get the benefits here. And then you pick up this additional thing. But those guys are going to spend the money anyway. So now we get two areas, right? This is what we were, this is not changed. People were going to roll their own, and they were going to get this anyway. So that's not changed. But now. For this little bit of extra cost, we get all of this additional benefit. And then we get some incremental benefit because we get incremental benefit from people who would never have spent the time to do it, 
but don't mind that their client gets a little bit better response or that they use a little bit less uh, a machine resource. So, you know, that's kind of good. But they wouldn't have done it themselves, but they get it for free. So this is, this is incremental benefit essentially for free. All right. What's that? What is that gray thing that we see there, that rectangle? What does it represent? It's the cost, the marginal cost savings that we get by having a software uh, uh, infrastructure that's allocator aware. Because all of these people would have rolled their own, but they don't have to now. Does that make sense? So this is cost savings, and this is value added. Cost savings, value added. Okay, now this is just so incremental cost savings. And notice there's this interesting point here. See a little point I, I circled here? Notice that these points mean absolutely nothing. So if you're inferring anything from where they cross, they're different units, the benefit is measured in something that's like utils, and the cost is measured not in dollars, but in, in, in opportunity costs from developers doing other things. So the relative heights of these things mean nothing. What really matters are these positions. Now take a moment and think about this, because this is what allocator, the economics of allocators is all about. It really is. We're trying to pick up this incremental utility and we're trying to save this, this incremental cost. Now just to drive home how important this is, imagine you're one of these super highfalutin people that can roll their own data structures and get really great results, right? That's really exciting. There's only one of you and there are only so many data structures you can roll in a month. So if you're gonna roll one, you wanna roll the best one. That means there may be nine other ones you would have liked to have rolled, but you just have only you. Well, guess what? You can pick the one that you wanna roll and still roll it, and you get the other ones at almost, which you couldn't have done, you still get them at almost as good as you had. So there's really no way to say this. When you have limited resources, no matter how good you are, if you have this as an option, it's strictly better than not having it as an option then you can either do it, or if you can't do it, you, you can make those choices. So I just, again, I want to say that there is a tremendous benefit to having this available, no matter who you are. All right. So this is a slight digression. Uh, which airline do you think I fly most often? The italicized one, I like that. So yes. And I happen to have an American Advantage AA card, and you can call this an AA meeting. And I want you to think of AA in any way that pleases you, but it means allocator aware. All right. Um, all right. So here's some various pictures. If I showed you this picture, which is the one in the paper that I'm working on, that I've been working on for two years, and is almost done, um, really close, uh, it probably wouldn't be that obvious as to what I'm talking about. So that's why I went through the process of trying to build it up and explain it. So now this is actually the picture. Does it make any sense? Do you see? Is there some, there's some meaning to it, right? We'll come back to it. Any discussion? Yes. Could you reiterate what alpha minus is? Sure. The question is, what is alpha minus? Here's alpha minus. Below this point, you will fly economy even if, if premium economy, no matter how good it is, is one penny more. At this point, you will fly first class, even if first class and business class are essentially the same thing, except you get an extra bag of sugar in first class. Okay, you, you see what I'm saying? This is the point where if you had only a two-tier system, you either would live with what you have or you'd go all in. So this is the threshold that we have without an allocator aware infrastructure. And this is the three-tiered system that we have if we do have an allocator-aware infrastructure, right? It is price discrimination with two regions and three regions. Does that make sense? Good, Good question. Thank you. All right. So I didn't normally I have time to come up with questions, but I'll leave it to you. Do you guys have any more questions? No, all right then. So the next thing is there are a number of different styles of making things allocator aware. They all achieve more or less the same benefits. Not quite, but more or less. We'll just talk about them. Um, so there are three models. The C++11 model, grown. 
the PMR model, also known as C++17, and BB20V, which no one knows anything about. Okay. There are four interface styles. The C++11 interface style grown. The kind we've been using since before I joined Bloomberg in 19, it's since 1997, and when I joined Bloomberg in 2001, which is the C++17 PMR style. How is that possible? Hmm. And then there's the BB20V style that no one knows anything about and we're not going to talk about. Okay. So the first one is compile time centric. It has zero overhead. It's designed to have zero overhead in time and space. Um, and it really has zero overhead, not almost zero. Zero. Okay, good. And it allows for non standard addressing. So it's the most flexible and it basically, it's, it's just, you know, I don't mind pain, let's just do it, whatever. <sighs> but it has some cons, and, it, and one of them is that nobody uses it because it sucks. Um, that's a real problem. So we're not really going to address this. This was a necessary step along the way to getting to what we want, and it's caused some tremendous um, bad feelings about using allocators because, for good reason, because it's, in, it's extremely difficult to make this work in a practical way because it invades the type of the object and it then becomes not interoperable unless your clients are templates. And I've been saying that forever and ever and it's just an unfortunate thing. Okay. Um, and that's the way the, the, the allocators were designed since their inception. They were template uh, implementation policies and that's not a good thing. We don't want that. So the next one is the BDE style, BDE for basic development environment or Bloomberg development environment, depending on whether we're talking about it for my book or we're using Bloomberg documentation. But anyway, um, so this has a moderate cost in, and it's, it's not as, uh, uh, it's got some very nice advantages, uh, which is it's very interoperable. It doesn't, it doesn't cause you to have to be a template to use it. You can get the, the resource out of the object to, just by calling a function, you're holding on to it polymorphically. Life is good. The cost of, of implementing it is much lower. Um, it does have some cons. Technically, it's not zero runtime and spatial overhead. But that's only technically, as we're going to see later, it is um, close enough. It has, uh, still has significant um, implementation and maintenance costs. So it's not for free. I mean, there's work to be done, but certainly is much, much better than the C++11 model. Um, the PMR style is really just the same as the BD style, but instead of being a raw pointer, it's handled in the way and spirit in which we do things with, with objects. But it's not really a value type because what is it? It's, it's holding on to a pointer, so um, not really worth talking about the difference. It's really pretty much the same thing, and the next generation of Bloomberg is going to try to take advantage of PMR instead of the fork that we did back in 2001 when I joined Bloomberg, where we, we actually stopped using the standard containers and did our own allocator-based containers that were compatible with the standard but, but had that extra feature. The alternative would have been to just completely not use them at all. So what we did is we created a fork, and now we're finally able to get back to them. Uh, and so, anyway, uh, the next thing is, is low cost, and what we're really going to try to do is we're going to try to get the compiler to help us, but we're not going to talk about this at much at all right now. Um, but I'm just putting this out here to think about, wouldn't it be nice if something like this existed? Uh, and we're not going to talk about that. So anyway, um, so no matter what the style is, uh, it's pretty much the same benefits no matter which one you use, except that the C++11 one gives you a little bit more at a much, much higher development and maintenance cost. And so we're really not thinking about that one. We're really not even considering it. And any discussion on that? If you're not familiar with these different styles, doesn't really matter because that's not what we're talking about today. Because we're really not going to use C++11 style. We're really thinking about today using a polymorphic, a PMR style, and then in the future, building on that in a way where you don't really have to see it. Come on in. All right, so questions?
Okay. So the next thing is performance benefits. And this talk is not about performance benefits, but it wouldn't be a talk if I didn't mention that we have some performance benefits. Um, performance gains arise from faster allocation and deallocation, but actually they really arise from better locality. And if you want to get a little bit of performance benefit, sure, custom memory allocation can help you. If you want to get incredible performance benefit, then you're talking about taking advantage of the computer hardware to get locality of reference. And this is something that we've been doing experiments with. Pablo Halpern and I, in particular, have been working together to come up with ways where we can characterize exactly what the boundaries are and what the underlying hardware uh, uh, mechanisms are that cause these things to change dramatically when you do and don't use allocators. For small problems, it's not really important. But as soon as the problems start to exceed a threshold, such as registers, L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache, there might even be an L4 cache, or main memory or secondary storage. As soon as one of those boundaries is crossed, then locality really kicks in. And if you don't have it, you, you get order of magnitude loss in performance. This is something that I don't think people appreciate when they're saying, wait, it's a virtual function. Oh my goodness, we're gonna lose, we're gonna lose all our performance. We can't do it. That was the way people were thinking several years ago. I don't think they're thinking that way anymore since 2017. I think we all understand that virtual functions, particularly in the case where they are used and needed uh, in, in uh, data structures that are created quickly um, and used and, and torn down, we can do devirtualization because the allocator and the, data and, the, uh, and the container type are both visible to the client compiler. So the same code that would have been generated using the C++11 zero overhead style is generated often using the PMR style. So that's just new information for many. Come on in. All right, which dominates? So for short running programs, faster allocation calls. Obviously, if you have a program where you don't need to do uh, serialization, not having to do that is great. You can have a local allocator, doesn't have to use a lock, doesn't have to worry about any of that. That's going to be faster. For long running programs, the allocation speed typically doesn't matter much at all. And what we're talking about is, is memory access and that dominates completely. So one common usage pattern is to build up the data structure with few or no deletes, access them briefly and, briefly and tear them down, and that's what a monotonic allocator does really well. Um, usage pattern two is repeatedly allocate and deallocate blocks uh, of a few distinct sizes, and that's why we have a multi-pool allocator because that's particularly good at doing that operation. Nope, come on in. And usage pattern three, need to destroy many objects and mass and, and, uh, and objects that own no resources except memory. So one of the things we can do with this, uh, for example, we use a managed allocator. And the idea here, uh, all local allocators are kinds of managed allocators typically. And so it may come as a surprise, not only can we not deallocate each piece of memory individually, if we have a data structure that doesn't use anything but memory resources from a particular allocator, we can unilaterally wink it out and it goes away and there is no cost associated with that deallocation. It's just gone. Uh, it, is, it is legal C++ to do it. Is it dangerous? Yeah, but so are a lot of other things. But if you're careful about it, it's fine and it allows for uh, other kinds of uses that aren't just performance-based in nature. Come on in. No, it's okay, go ahead. So memory locality is particularly important. Uh, we have many levels of caching in hardware and it's kind of fascinating to see what happens when you overflow one of the, uh, one of the, the, the boundaries. So for, for programs that are small that all fit in L1 cache, don't have to worry about it at all. Um, but long running programs that allow memory to diffuse across larger areas, right? So if you have memory that's all focused in one little area, that's, that's wonderful. And you have cache lines and things come in in cache lines. By the way, cache lines and pages are special because 
it doesn't matter where things are in memory so much, it matters a little bit, it doesn't matter where they are in memory, as long as you have densely populated cache lines or densely populated pages. Because what will happen is all of the stuff that you need will come in in a single page or it'll come in in a single cache line. But as soon as memory is allowed to diffuse throughout all creation, then when you pull in a page, you get only a little bit of what you need. And so you wind up not being able to have all of your memory in a small cache because you can't fit all the pages in or you can't fit all of the data into your L1 cache because each cache line has only a little bit of what you need. That makes sense. So again, pages and cache lines are special because if they're not densely populated, uh, you wind up thrashing. And that is where allocators help tremendously. Does that make sense? Okay, this is, if you don't understand the mechanism, that's okay, I mean, it, it took a lot of smart people a long time to get it. But this is the way hardware is designed. It's designed to take advantage of these things. And what's interesting is, not, and I, I've been doing a lot of reading about this so that I can figure out how to explain it, not only does it do it because people write code that way, but because it does it that way, people write code that way. So it's a reinforcing thing. So if you know that the hardware is going to take advantage of locality, you will write your programs to take advantage of locality, and allocators help you do that. Okay. So loss in locality dominates everything. As soon as you have memory that's I think we found around two to the 18th elements. As soon as you exceed that threshold, you're starting to get outside and you get, you get paging effects. And when, when diffusion is allowed to occur, which means that, that, that you have non-densely populated pages, um, you can get an order of magnitude loss in performance easily, sometimes more. All right, and the whole point of having local allocators, it doesn't get rid of diffusion, but it decreases it back from the order of magnitude disaster that it was to maybe a, a factor of two, which is huge. Okay. And local memory allocators facilitate threading, and this is another benefit of, of, of allocators. I'm just mentioning um, you don't get accidental cache line contention. Uh, we've heard of this, this notion of, of fault sharing, right? You don't, if you have allocators and the allocators are tied to a thread or tied to a, a, a subsystem that's acted on by a single thread, you don't have to worry about fault sharing because your cache lines are densely populated with stuff that is being worked on by your thread. Whereas if it's not densely populated by stuff being worked on by your thread, thread then there could be a concurrent thread that is also working on the same cache lines and that is what fault sharing is. And how do global compilers or global um, uh, allocators deal with it? They waste memory so that it doesn't happen, but you still don't have the densely populated uh, um, data in your cache lines. You just have not having the contention, and that's not as good as having the dense population. Does that make sense? I'm saying a lot of stuff here. Okay. So achieving maximum performance requires global knowledge and a solid understanding of different allocator characteristics. And the point is, is that this is not an elementary technique. This is, this is not something you teach in school like, oh, I'm going to learn computing. What am I going to do? No. This is hard. And this is advanced. And that's why you're here. And that's why this is a very expert conference. On the other hand, um, it can be packaged up in a way where people can consume it. If you don't have it and you're in a large organization and people try to do it themselves by hand, you know, it's an order of magnitude or two worse than just doing it in a controlled way where the people who actually understand what they're doing do it and provide it for you in a, with a bow on it. Hence, allocator aware software infrastructure as opposed to roll your own and pray. Okay. And by the way, if you're an application engineer, most likely you went to school and did a lot of interesting things in some domain and didn't study allocators for 20 years, maybe. So again, there's some reason to think that you want to have the domain expertise package this up and make it available as opposed to leaving it all open and saying, yeah, you want a TV? Go build it. <laughs> all right. Um, any questions? Yes. Oh, both. Go ahead. In order. The question is, if you have a thread local allocator, do I have an idiom to avoid sharing threads? Actually, it's just the opposite. 
a global allocator can do the mapping for you so that you say, okay, I have a thread, I have thread affinity, uh, all my allocations are presumably coming from this thread life is good. As Soon as you introduce a thread pool, now the threads are not tied with the subsystems that have the locality. The goal here is to tie the allocator with the subsystem and let the threads be independent of that packaging. Does that not answer your question? Okay, the question is how, does, how do you actually make a local allocator be associated with the data that it works on, right? That's what you're saying. So imagine the experiment of, of Benchmark 2 in, in the 2017 talk, which I'm sure you've seen many times. Anyway, you have an array of array, array of array, right? Okay, uh, th this array is a real C, C++ array. This is a linked list, okay? And the question is, when you're, when you're going to do stuff, if the linked list is in order in memory versus if the linked list is all over creation, right? If the linked list is all over creation because memory is diffused, right, then you're going to get very uh, 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 inefficient results when you iterate over the subsystem, which is the linked list, just a circular iteration, okay? So now, a local allocator, imagine at each element of the array, you put a local allocator. And when you delete something from the linked list, it goes to the free list of that local allocator. When you put something back, it goes here. And instead of moving something across, because moves we know are really fast, instead we copy that information. Now you get an order of magnitude improvement in performance as soon as you exceed certain thresholds. So one of the things that we are going to talk about is move, in general, if it's not thought about, is a bad idea. In general, move is bad. There are cases where move is good. When is move good? When you are naturally dealing with the same allocator. We'll talk about that later. But if somebody said, oh, I would like to use a different allocator here for better access, but then I couldn't use move, oh darn, that's the tail wagging the dog. It's exactly the opposite. So if you have to choose between memory locality and moving something once, and then, and then not having ex large access, you know, it's just, there's no comparison. So I think that may answer your question, and then I think you had a question. Uh, more of a comment. Uh, a lot of this is related to the von Neumann architecture, uh, the stored program architecture. You were saying about um, diffusion and caches. Of course, caches appeared because we saw the difference in performance, relative performance of processes versus main memory. And therefore, you ended up with caches being introduced. Now we end up with the issues of associativity in caches because you want to keep it dense in a page. But the issue is, is multiple pages could be mapped to the same cache line. Because okay. Of associativity. Right. Because of the stored program architecture we've got, we're shackled and hidebound by x86. Okay, hold on. So we're talking. Now we're talking about computer architecture. This this may or may not be in scope, but I'm going to try. So there is a range. There's direct map memory. There's fully associative memory, and there's a hybrid between the two. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, no, I'm talking about the way that caches map memory lines when there's access. Yes. Yes, what, what you just said, set associativity is the middle ground between a fully associative cache and a direct map cache. Okay, so that's just computer architecture 101. Now, it turns out you have a two-way, a four-way, an eight-way, you're real close to getting fully associative in practice. We don't do fully associative because they're too expensive and they're too slow and they have too much hardware. The direct map is a bad idea because that's great until you have one thing that's diffused somewhere else, one thing that's out of place, and then it screws everything up. So two-way makes sense, four-way makes sense, eight-way makes sense, sure. But the point is, that's at a level of detail that almost no one cares about because it's an approximation to a fully associative cache. So if you're thinking about what I'm talking about, pretend the cache is fully associative and then live with the fact that I'm lying to you 10%, and you're good. So let's assume it's a fully associative cache. Now what is your point? Um, the point is, is that when we're looking at allocating dense memory and trying to keep it in the size inside a page, keep it dense, the issue is, is that when you've got diffusion, that diffusion can actually cause you to tip over the associativity limit, and then you can end up with false sharing occurring. 
Okay, you said two things. The diffusion can tip over the associativity limit. I agree with that. I agree with that. The fault sharing is a separate issue that has to do with multi-threading, which has what you just said before doesn't have to do with multi-threading. No, no, no. This is this is multi-threading. Is I've got the same cache line. I'm ping-ponging. That's messy. That's that's different. What I'm talking about is this cache line is mapped to two or four addresses or eight addresses or however many. And what's happened is I've just diffused and what's happened now is these two memory addresses are mapping to the same cache line. Okay, but keep in, I, okay, fault sharing is a separate issue from being unfortunate enough to have multiple places in main memory mapped to the same tag. They're different issues. You're right that diffusion could cause that to happen more than non-diffusion. If memory is just sitting right the way you allocated it to begin with, not only do you have the benefits of what you just described, you have the benefits of a forward marching system or prefetch. You have the benefits of multiple memory banks being accessed in cycles. All kinds of good things happen when you don't diffuse. But I want to keep each one of these things compartmentalized. So, uh, but thank you. It's a good thing I studied for this. <laughs> um, all right, I'm tired now. Cost. Cost. Um, so there are two different kinds of costs. One of the things that I've, I've made little of in the past and I'd like to take back, there are costs associated with creating an, an uh, allocator-aware software infrastructure. They are not imagined, they are real, they are significant, and they need, they need to be addressed, we need to be aware of them. There are two kinds of costs. There are the upfront cross costs of creating and maintaining this structure by library developers. That is, a, that is true, okay? So the plumbing of constructors, if what I need to do is I need to take an existing type that works, allocates memory, and I say, okay, for each constructor, I'm gonna take in an allocator, I'm gonna make sure that every sub-object gets that allocator and does the right thing, I call that plumbing. In order to plumb this stuff takes effort. You got to get it right. Failing to plumb it and then using it in an interesting context like putting it on secondary storage will kill you, right? So that's bad. We don't want that to happen. Um, this effort, however, is borne by people that know how to do this and have the tools and the training to do it, typically, right? Then there are the incremental costs of exploiting this. Now, if no one had ever heard of allocators, the world would be a better place in some sense because they wouldn't be worried about them. They would say, should I use an allocator? Should I not use an allocator? Oh my goodness. Because that causes stress. And what happens when you have stress? You eat. And then you get fat. And then you have medical problems. Right? So that would be better. So there's a cognitive burden associated with this stuff. And that is a cost. And people will argue that that cognitive burden is too much to bear. I can't know that allocators can make my world better. If I don't know about that, I'm better. And just, let's not look. So that's true. This is borne by many most application developers. There are a lot of application developers out there that bear this cost of, of just suffering. Okay, so converting an allocator to uh, unaware class to AA for typical, hmm? Hey, can I, can sure. I something real quick? There is, there's a mechanical cost to doing this as well because when you have all that plumbing in place, uh, especially with like, you know, type, we talked about this before, like types in a standard library, like, uh, you know, Tuple has. We will options. get there, okay. I promise. But, but that uh, introduction of all the allocator aware versions of the constructors effectively um, increase your compile time costs uh, because overload resolution is one of the most expensive things you can do in C++ and having uh, template and non-template uh, overload resolution is a particularly expensive case oh. and it, as materially if you benchmark compile time. So, so, so what I'm hearing, I, I heard a bunch of things, but the one that's, that's relevant right here, that, and we'll get to the other one that's relevant, not only does it create a, an explosion of constructors, but the overload resolution I heard just now, here and now, is one of the most expensive things at compile time for C++, and that's unfortunate. I really am sad about that. Okay. I want to just mention that in, in our world, we don't use ADL and that kind of thing by default. We use static members of the struct, have done so forever, and are pleased as punch we always have. Just saying. But, but, no, but seriously, the point is, is that yes, there is a combinatorial explosion of simple types, and it, a perfect example is pair. Pair, once you add allocators, is a disaster. 
So that is the, you know, and tuple, disaster, disaster. So those are the, the really great examples of where this thing needs some love, right? That's your point. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. All right. So for typical class, and we're really at the slide right now, for typical classes, uh, it's relatively straightforward. We have to add a trailing allocator. We have to forward new arguments to the base class. And by the way, for typical allocators, it literally is an extra optional argument. And now we're moving to from the extra optional argument to an overload because there, there are, which I'm, I fail to remember the, the subtle nuanced reason why the, the, default, the default parameter is expensive. Explicit. explicit. Can you explain it? All right, so it has to do with explicit, but what we're going to do is instead of having the equal zero, we're going to have the two, the two ones. One of them is going to be with the allocator, and the other one's going to be explicit. Is that what we're saying? It's related to explicit. Anyway, the bottom line is the old way of doing it. Whatever you had, you would say allocator star equals zero, and now we're going to have two of them. One of them, we're not going to have it, and one of them, we are. Yes? I mean, if I had to think through it, right? I mean, you have the case that you have a, you know, something that will otherwise be an explicit constructor now with the default and you get some funny business there in, right? Like you have to worry about, oh, yeah, there, there's some, some funny business with explicit, yeah. with explicit and the default thing, sure. because the default thing is, is, is not tied to the actual signature. It is a one, it is an end parameter thing, regardless of whether it's defaulted. So it has been decided that rather than do it with the old way, with the equal, whatever, we will double the number of constructors, which is sad, but that's what we're going to do. Okay. Um, so we forward the new argument. Uh, we need to be able to denote every AA type with a trait so that we know that it is that. That's something that we need to be able to sniff out so that you know, we know that any, anything that says, oh, I'm, I'm a container and I know that you're allocator aware, so I'm going to inject you with an allocator when I create you. Uh, that has to happen. Now for non-typical classes, they're more challenging. Generic template and container types, and we're going to talk about those, those things. So. Um, Something like complex, what's going on here? Um, well, we don't have, uh, uh, we don't have um, um, allocation going on, right? So it so requires interacting with alienness of the type. Uh, if, if the type allocates, we've got to do something with that. So we just introduced some interesting overhead. Um, it's a container type, a type like vector, then it involves touching the constructors, so that's another thing. Now, if it's a non-allocating template type like pair, now it's really, it's, we have to think about what are we trying to do. So we have to teach people what do you do in a case like pair. And typically what we do is we get somebody like Pablo to think about it for years and come up with the answer. And then that's the answer. We're done. But you wouldn't want to try to ask somebody, a normal person, to deal with that. And then there's this weirdness like shared pointer. And it's not regular. And so somebody who's really wise has to figure out, well, what does it mean to make a shared pointer allocator aware? So these are the strange types. We do not want our clients doing this kind of work. We want somebody who really understands what they're doing to do this for us, which is why an allocator aware software infrastructure team, that would make sense. And when it comes to something really hard like these guys, we want it to be done by the standards committee and by the very best and brightest in the world and not just the best person who happens to be on a five person team at a company that, you know, we don't want that because that's not, that's not good enough. But for the basic stuff, it's not too bad. So it's a maintenance burden. Now, this is information that we've taken from our own code base, and we think it's about a 10% source code overhead. Now, this is pre-C++11 uh, you know, with having to write all of your moves and, and all of that. So it could be worse. But it's in on the order of this. But it's very regular code, so it's not terrible. Now, learning to do this, learning how the training involved is definitely a real cost. And uh, there's an opportunity cost, because when we have our best and brightest doing this work, they're not doing other hard work. So that's important. Um, other important projects might be delayed. Uh, so these are costs, for sure. There's some mitigating factors. This stuff lends itself to automation. That's a good thing. BD Verify uh, is something that we have that currently makes sure that you do it right. And in fact, we're in the process of making it take something that wasn't allocator aware and turning it into something that's allocator aware, which is something that is a starting point for the next step. 
BV20Z will eliminate most manual plumbing. In other words, imagine if you didn't have to do that work, but you just gave some hints and it just happened. More on that later. This technology is itself a very substantial one-time upfront cost. So think about that. We have an upfront cost. Do we spend the money, a lot of money, to figure out how to stop developers all over the world from worrying about implementing allocator-aware software infrastructure? We'll see. It's kind of like self-driving cars. So here's something to think about. How much more expensive, once we have the technology, is a self-driving car than a non-self-driving car? Think about it. What would make a self-driving car more expensive? Is it the software? No. So what is it? It's probably $300. Three hundred dollars of ASICs. Insurance. Uh, okay. I mean, Insurance. Just the you know rolling in, repaying the R and D costs is probably the biggest component. Okay, what if the R and D costs are just a write off? Bloomberg does it for you. <laughs> <laughs> then it's kind of free, right? It's kind of like we discovered a cure to penicillin. Awesome. I'd like to. A cure, uh, not a cure to penicillin, but a cure. <laughs> a, a cure. We discovered penicillin. My bad. Yes. So you see what I'm saying? This, this one-time cost will address a lot of other repeating upfront costs. It itself is a huge cost, but compared to the repeating of the other cost, it is nothing, we think. So the typical cost of using an allocator where software infrastructure is comparatively small, and we're gonna discuss style a little bit later on. It's much faster than rolling your own, right? Because as we discussed, if you have something where you have a data structure and you can simply assign it an allocation strategy by composition, that's got to be faster than starting from scratch going, okay, I'm gonna go write this thing and I'm gonna do this whole thing and then maintain it, right? You simply supply the desired allocator construction, requires additional testing, what doesn't? There's no need for custom, uh, if there's no need for custom memory allocation, you can ignore them, right? So if you don't want to care about allocators, you don't do anything different. If you have an allocator aware software infrastructure, you simply ignore the documentation, you ignore the optional parameter, and you go on about your merry way and feel guilty that you weren't propagating the allocator awareness to your stuff, which is again a cost. Um, you would use and test it normally. It's entirely opt-in. No one is saying to you as a client of an allocator aware software infrastructure that you must make your code allocator aware, although it might be a good idea. Remember, it will cause you frustration because you didn't do it. You'll always go home at night saying, I sh should have done it, didn't do it. So the additional cognitive burden, larger interfaces, trailing allocator arguments in every constructor, more English to read, optionally specify the basic allocator, you know. Although the net benefit for those who exploit A uh, is clear, right? clear that, that there's a benefit if you're going to use it. If you're not going to use it, it's less clear. There's additional opportunities for misuse, right? What happens if your uh, container outlives the allocator? Now, this is a fear that everybody wakes up in the middle of the night and goes, oh my god, I, I know this is happening. But it really doesn't happen that much. That's really rare. Um, what's more likely to happen is that you use a special purpose allocator where you shouldn't. And that happens routinely. Uh, use a monotonic allocator outside a loop, go into a loop, allocate a lot of stuff, run out of memory, and blow up. Don't do that. Just don't do that. Use a local allocator for a string and then throw the string in an exception. Well, yeah. If, if, if what you do causes a dangling pointer, no matter how you do it, it's bad. It's hard to do that. You have to kind of want to, but you can. You're saying you may have found a way to do it by accident, that's great. Try not to do that, you know? <laughs> so there's also this fear that it's incompatible with some features. That's true, but we need to be clear about what ones it's incompatible with. They require non-trivial constructors, which means the compiler-generated ones don't work. Uh, the problem is exasperated by C++11 move variants. Aggregate initialization does not currently work. Uh, but we're looking at, once we understand these issues, we'll just make them work. We'll make all of those features that don't work work. Why not? 
So we'll do that. The assertion that allocators do not interact well with the C plus, modern C++ move semantics is completely and utterly and totally false. There's no truth to that. Yes? So what happens if I uh, move construct a PMR vector versus move assign a PMR vector? You ask, I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer it because that's a huge question, but you said what's the, what's the difference between if I move construct PMR vector versus if I move assign it? I, I don't know even how to begin to answer that. I may, I may not be able to. What specifically so, are you looking so for? My understanding is that one of them works and one of them breaks. Uh, it basically leaves your, um, your moved object in a state that is... Okay, not so now what we're talking about is something else, which is the radioactive state and whatever, whatever. That is sort of out of scope for this discussion, but because the idea that moves in and of themselves are used way more often than are appropriate. There are cases where moves make sense, and there are cases where they absolutely do not make sense, as we were discussing. I think what you're talking about, though, is the case where you have something where you, where you, where you, when you move from it, it ceases to be usable as a, as a, it doesn't satisfy all of its initial invariance. Now, that's a, that's kind of a, a, a philosophy of the C++ standard is we don't do that. So when we construct something, we construct it. It has a piece. We don't, we don't move from it in a non-throwing way such that we leave it in a less constructed state than it was when, when it was created. So, so to be clear, my understanding is that the move from object is always in the sort of half uh, constructed state that we don't care about. I'm talking about the object that you moved to. Okay, the so the move from object, object is not it's, it's not, it's not true that it's in a half constructed state. No. Okay, but I'm saying I don't care about that. You don't care about it, okay. <laughs> I'm talking about the object that I want to use after the expression. The object that you want to use after the expression, you've moved from here to there. Now, the system where this all was nice and happy, now you've moved its, its guts. There's a hole in this memory block, and there's this other subsystem that has to go long distance to go get it. That's called diffusion. And if you do enough of that in a, this doesn't happen when you're returning from a function. This happens when you allocate a static block of memory, or a external block of memory, let's say you a dynamic array, and then you take pieces out of the array and put them in some other array. And now when you come to work on this array and you're going around this array, you find yourself jumping all over memory because you've done moves. Had you done copies instead of moves, life would be good. So we need to be clear. Another point, another point, when you return something using just return by value and it's an allocating type, that is not being done by a move. That's being done by RVO or NRVO. Has been so since 2003. And it's a misconception that moves do anything for you. In fact, if you explicitly move, it's a, it's a pessimism. You should never do that. What you want to do is let the compiler do it for you using RVO. So we're not talking about the return semantics. We're talking about static. I don't mean static. I'm talking about uh, dynamically added, allocated data structures that have locality. And as a result of repeated moves across memory boundaries, cease to have locality. And that's why I'm saying move is a bad idea. Copy is better. Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm trying to get at? It does. I'm just objecting to the notion. The, the, the thing that you said that made me raise my hand was yes. that there is no interaction between allocators and C++ uh, uh, move semantics, but there is in the case of uh, PMR allocators. Okay, and I'm trying to say that there is no inter there's no interaction between PMR allocators and move semantics that would make you say, oh, uh, PMR allocators don't work well with move. That's not the case. You want to say something? Yes. <laughs> I believe what Zach is remembering is when you do a move assignment of like a PMR vector, sometime that when you do a move assignment, the, the destination object will keep its allocator, whatever that is. So oh, it sometimes will. Sometimes it will be able to pilfer the guts and take the allocation, and sometimes it will have to make copies. Right. Or so make a copy of the make a new allocator. Right. So if you try to move from one object to another and they don't have the same allocator, it degenerates to a copy. So um, yes. Dave, David Sankel uh, presented a couple of years ago in Flute. I'm pretty sure what he said was, uh, if it doesn't have the same allocator type, it's not that it, it's a pessimization, but it's actually unique. I may be uh, misremembering that's that. Swap. No, that's not. That's Is that not swap the case. I'm thinking of? Yeah. Swap. Okay. Swap. Yeah. It's undefined behavior to swap. But think about when you use swap. You use swap in a container. What is a container? It's, it's a local arena, and by definition, every container, every element of every container uses the same allocator. That's the scoped allocator model. So the time you want to use moves is precisely inside a vector or inside an arena. So if you're inside a local memory 
arena, use move because you, you're not hurting yourself. You're all good, right? So you use swap, you use move, use any of those things. That's exactly the time that you want to do that. That's, that's when you want to. You want to insert into a vector. You would not copy the elements along. You would move them. Now, what does that cost you? It does cost you sequential access in the computer. It doesn't cost you locality, but as far as prefetch fetch goes and as far as consecutive memory bank access goes, hurts you a little. But we're not going to talk about that because at that level, no ap uh, application programmer is going to care. That's a computer. That's what computers do. Leave it to them. But as far as the main important one about crossing a memory pool, when you're in a container, use swap. When you're not in a container, think about using swap. You see what I'm saying? So swap is used in algorithms. Algorithms are used on containers. That's awesome. So algorithms are not used across containers. Does that, I hope that's a really important point. I think that, yes? Uh, when you say on here, cop, or compiler generated copy operations won't work, uh, is that because you're saying that the AA class needs to have additional? Right, because you, you, can't, you can't generate an allocator aware today in C17, you don't generate an allocator aware constructor. Right, exactly. But in a new world, in the future, you of course would. Okay. I'm going to talk more about this. It's a really important point. Yes? You said before that uh, there is a little bit of a burden to using an allocator aware constructor if you don't find these allocators. Yes. I exactly say in the cost of memory because you might cost not know you will need allocators later. All right, without agreeing or disagreeing, although I don't disagree, uh, <laughs> what was said was, if you have the option and elect not to use it now, that it's there for you to use when you want to is a great thing. Yes, it is. If you then have gone on and written code that doesn't propagate the allocators because you said, I'll never care, and then you wake up one day and say, damn, I wish I cared, that's unfortunate. It's very much, in fact, um, Matt Austin pointed out that allocators and const have a lot in common. If you're going to use const, you have to use it everywhere or it will bug the, the bejesus out of you. You have to use it. You have to do it right. So allocators are kind of like that. If you, you, the low-level infrastructure will be allocator aware. At some point, you may stop caring and stop propagating allocators, and so the higher-level infrastructure is not allocator aware. Then, if you decide, gee, I really wish it were, you have to go back and do some work. You can, and there may be tools to help you do that, but I'm saying if you don't do it up front, you may have to go back and change it. However, as a pure user, if you're just doing your own thing and you're never gonna plumb anything, sure it's nice to know that I wrote my code, it's too slow, I can drop an allocator into this data structure and it runs three times faster, awesome, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah. Totally you agree. Might not know up front, but if you're choosing Mm -hmm. You heard it from him. He's saying that having an allocator aware software infrastructure increases your, uh, risk. decreases risk, that's absolutely true, and increases your, your options. Okay, so um, the, we just need to make sure that the productive lifetime of our object doesn't exceed that of our allocator, requires some care. Um, it limits the applicability of certain standard facilities that manage object lifetimes. Namely, these guys. We have to deal with those. Education, tools, and governance. We need to, we need to address, like, when are we going to do this stuff? Proper training costs money. Um, code reviews. People actually have to be trained on how to review this kind of code, and that's a cost. Um, we have tools that we have to create. Policies we have to create. Uh, but that's not atypical of powerful things. When you have power, you have to create the infrastructure and the governance to make sure that it's not abused. And then, of course, there's multi-threading, unit testing, and C++ itself are all things that are hard and require training and governance. Um, bottom line, there are real substantial costs, substantial upfront library development costs, modest incremental application developer costs. We claim that a Valuable, uh, credible, reasonable proposition remains. Um, if we don't have hierarchically reusable allocator-aware software, then some application developers will need to write it. 
And that is very, very expensive in the short term and in the long term because you have to maintain that stuff and that stuff is not reusable because it was written for their purpose, but you still have to maintain it. We've been down that road. We know that's bad. We don't want to do that again. All right. And of course, the people that don't do that will be forced to do without. Any discussion on this? These are the costs. I have a question about um, testing. Yes. Um, do you also maybe do um, some extra level of testing just for, I don't know, checking locality or if anything, if anything goes wrong when um, making your existing code allocated or where? Um, do you also test for that? The testing that we do is primarily or to make benchmarking inside your CI or something like that. Benchmarking is separate. The testing that we do is to make sure that the allocators are propagated to the sub region so that the, the, the plumbing works. That's the extra testing. We can also do that by inspection. So we don't actually have to write running code. We have we have analysis tools that verify it up front. So that's a good thing. When we have compilers that can write it. We won't have to worry about it at all because it'll be right by design because compilers did it. So it's that kind of level. So no, there isn't a lot of extra runtime checking that has to be done because it's a very systematic kind of thing. Okay. So moving along, collateral benefits. What are we at? I have a half hour? 28 minutes. All righty. Um, collateral benefits. So apart from the dramatic performance gains, there are other benefits. Rapid prototyping, modularity, hierarchical reuse, testing, instrumentation, and object placement, to name a few. Um, so when we invest in this ultra high performance stuff, that first class, we don't get the collateral benefits. By the way, this is a true story. If you sit in first class on the plane that I go across the ocean with, okay, right in the front, the first row of business class, there's this huge restroom. But if you're in first class, which is on the other side, you actually aren't as close. So if the plane catches fire and you need to get out, it's right near the exit, or if you need to use the restroom, it's better to be in business class for that than it is to be in first class. Um, and the reason the analogy here is, if you need something in a hurry, the first class solution doesn't work because you have to build it, whereas the business class solution is available immediately. So there's another analogy here. So business class has its advantages even over first in that it's already there. The latency is essentially zero. The first class solution takes weeks or months to write. All right, so rapid prototyping. I claim this is really important. It reduces risk. You can select from a suite of allocation algorithms. You can plug them in. You can measure it. You can tune it. You can repeat as needed. Now imagine a situation where you don't know if this is going to make things better or not. You spend two, three, four weeks writing this custom data structure. You plug it in, and it's no faster. Oops, now what do you do? Do you keep it and pretend that it made it faster, or do you just tell your boss, I just wasted a month? You know you're going to keep it, and now you've got this extra crud that does nothing. Okay, or you could have tried this in an hour, found out it was a bad idea, tried something else in an hour, found out that was a bad idea, tried something else in an hour, found out that was a good idea, and been done in three hours and get a raise. This is good. But you can deploy it immediately. If you find out you've got something good, you can deploy it immediately. Yes? So the, the the previous idea of trying all these things in hour presupposes that you have the ability to measure, tune, and repeat all correctly, all accurately in that same hour, right? That's, that's kind of a, a big collateral benefit. Well, the fact that you have the ability to model it. You don't have to write the code that you, you hypothesize. This code will make my overall application run quickly. You have the way to check that. Even if, let's say you do that, and it makes it run really quickly, and you go, this is awesome, and I think I can get another 20% if I write it by hand and it takes me a month. You still get 80% of it immediately. Your customers are happy then on the next release. You get even more benefit, but the point is, if you look at the customer happiness over time curve, it's way better. If you look at the number of hours spent achieving nothing curve, it's way better, right? So that's good. You can also use it as a proof of concept. That's the thing that's really important. You can deploy it immediately, or you can use it as a proof of concept to create a project that you are then going to deploy later. Yes? I would like to plug in here my talk. And as a collateral benefit, you get testability of your code. 
Oh if yes. If you use the uh, the polymorphic allocator, that's my thought. That will come up, by the way. Right, that will come up. I'm going to talk about that. That's another benefit, that, that they're instrumentable. BD style allocators are chainable, so you can compose them. Um, examples, I have a small block allocator that can fall back on a large block allocator. This is, you can just create that right on the fly, and it's as simple as putting large block allocator, small block allocator takes from large block allocator, container takes from small block allocator, three lines of code, done. There's no magic here. Um, also, maybe one allocator provides some metrics gathering or f before it falls back. Suppose I just want to count something. There's some very sophisticated and interesting things you can do. It's just like playing with a, you know, a, 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 not a Lego set. What are those things that are like, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of the toy. There's a, some toy that you do that. But you can just, just, just chain things together, and that's what this is all about. Like an erector set, but it's not really a multidimensional thing. It's really like a pipe. It's like saying, I wanted to do this thing, then I wanted to do this thing, this thing, and then the, as the flow throws through, the dials spin, and you learn all this stuff, and it gives you memory, and it, maybe there's some sort of data structure here that makes this part really efficient. Or it is a decorator pattern for sure. All right. Oh, look at what we have. This is probably the closest thing to a silver bullet that you'll have when it comes to memory allocation. And what's awesome about it is it works in any size system. So it's not something that you're limited by the size of your system. You plug that into anything. And it checks for memory leaks, logs and allocates calls, matches the allocations with all allocations, text exception safety, um, all kinds of good things you can do with this. Um, this is a really important one, by the way. It, it, it was talked about it at ACCU. One of the things that allocators can do is they can give you special debugging blocks where when the thing is, when the memory is deallocated, it checks the sentinels on either side of the memory allocated. And if they're not the magic, the magic uh, combination that the thing was expecting, it tells you, wait, you overflowed memory. This is awesome stuff. And you can do this stuff in arbitrarily large systems. There's no limit to the size where you can use this stuff. It's not invasive, right? You don't need to go and instrument all your code. You just plug it in. Every piece of library code that was ever written does not have to be changed. I said this, it works on arbitrary large systems. So Attila is going to talk about this at length at, at, uh, in, at 55 minutes in this room. There's a great example of where you can use the interface of a ubiquitous uh, uh, allocator uh, 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 parameter to pass in other things. And in this particular case, memory usage on an object basis. And what it does is it leverages the allocator interface and it can multiply inherit from some other thing. And then, as an opt-in, something can ask this allocator that was passed in, are you interested in my memory allocation statistics? And it says yes. Then you do the dynamic cast to the base class of the thing that's doing the statistics gathering. And then it can offer statistics. This works really well. It's used at Bloomberg. It's, it's just awesome. Anyway, this is strictly better than other solutions. Uh, as I said, it's fine-grained, it's opt-in, uh, provides object as opposed to class-based info, and again, it works on arbitrarily large code. Um, you can place op, yes? What do, what do BSLMA and GTKMA stand for? Okay, so in, in our nomenclature, we have package groups that are three letters. Then we have packages that live within package groups that are one to three letters. So the first three letters here, GTK, stands for something. That's the GTK package group, and it's the MA package in the GTK package group. It's not so important what it means, but the fact that it's hierarchical and tight so that you know the hierarchy by inspection and you can generate all kinds of things from that little bit of text, that's what's important. So no, this is not, this is not uh, intended to be some awesome name. This is better than a zip code. Better than you know what you know what I'm saying. It's so, so the idea is that you can use the allocator from one group along with the allocator store from another group. This allocator lives. This allocator lives in the BSLMA package of the BSL package group. It's a very low level package group. It's like an infrastructure package group, and that's the package in which it lives. The allocator is the interface. It's the one that has that defines the virtual functions. The allocator store implements the allocator interface. This is at a much higher level in the physical hierarchy. This is kind of like at the application level. So somebody took something that's almost like a standard part 
and then they had an application part like a middle level uh, and they said here and they derived this thing and 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 it, and it you can pass it around to anything but if if one of their things takes it it will report memory usage and it does so through dynamic cast by the way there's a section in the second volume of the book that I am working on that says use dynamic cast only when you don't need it and this is exactly a case where you use it only when you don't need it but if you have it, I can give you the information. So it's an opt-in kind of thing. So again, but are, are those intended to be mix and match? Like I could have chosen an allocator store from a different group if I'd wanted to. If there was such a thing, sure. And you, yes, the allocator store is not in the interface. What's in the interface is the allocator itself. So I could have an object, let's say I had two different allocator stores, A and B. And my code says, do you participate in allocator store A? But no, it participates in allocator store B, but not A. It would say, no, I can't dynamic cast to you, so I won't do it. Do you see what I'm saying? But you could imagine something that participates in both A and B, in which case it would be able to dynamic cast, but you'd need an object that multiply inherits from both. If yes. I may try to like give a bit more clarity sure. to the description. The, the, the example below is a specific subsystem of this, the, overall, like, inter, like, the, the overall application framework. And so what this provides is for us to be able to debug the memory used in that particular subsystem uh, without having to look at every other memory allocation in the software. Okay, so what's critical about this is it doesn't just tell you like you would if you're using purifier, quantifier, or something like that. It says for this particular instance of a subsystem, how much memory is being used, as opposed to how much memory is being used by this uh, type or something like that. That's really what the difference is. In any event, there are very interesting things you can do with instrumentation, and this happens to be a really powerful one that I wanted to mention, but let me move on. Placement of objects in memory is really important, and that's something that we needed to do and you can just do. And particularly, uh, if I want to put an entire object in memory, not just its footprint, say I can use uh, uh, placement new to put a vector in something, but I can't take its guts and put it in there, but allocators let me do that. And it's particularly good for memory mapped uh, uh, hardware. And we do this at Bloomberg. Uh, that's this example. The G malloc allocator, which is again, it's tied to uh, the ability to take some memory in a process and just swap it out to memory mapped IO. And then when, the, when the, it's time to put it back in, it just swaps it back in and it just works. So you can do this kind of thing if you can place the whole object in some arena. But if you can't, and unless you have allocators, you can't, you don't have this benefit. Then there's garbage collection. Sometimes you want to be able to just say, I want all this stuff to go away. And you don't want to go through with pointers, uh, shared pointers, because there's a lot of overhead to shared pointers. And if really all you want to do is say, I want to build this up, I want to traverse it, I want it all to go away, and I don't care about cycles, and I don't care about any of that, I just want it to go away, then this is the way to do it, and it's dramatically faster, and it's an architectural rather than a performance thing, but it's also a performance thing. All right, so pluggable composition, that's again, the utility here is just the ability to just put things together. Uh, most of them depend on the ability to do it at runtime. The ability, to, it's not a direct implication of doing things at runtime, but it does help make things interoperate more better without having to recompile other stuff when you decide to compose. So that's a really nice thing. Without having invested in this stuff, all of it becomes prohibitively expensive for clients. So what we're saying is the company is doing the extra work for the clients so the clients don't have to. And we are actually, we got about 20 minutes left and I do want to get to the last part which is the concerns. Does anybody want to make a quick comment on what I just said? as far as the collateral benefits, because there are a lot of benefits besides performance that you get when you have this kind of infrastructure. Yes? I'll just comment that uh, test allocators are a lot easier to use than Valgrin. I found that out the other week. Okay. So I, I, I just use Valgrin, what do I need all this for? I it's just, the, the suggestion is test allocators are a lot easier to use than Valgrind, and Valgrind is, is the bigger the program, the bigger the thing that you're operating on the more overhead there is as opposed to this thing where you simply use it and it, it works regardless of how big the program is. All you have to do is link it. Yes? Also, if you need custom, custom pointer types, then you don't have any other option than doing this, no? 
If you need what kind of pointers? Like fancy pointers or some kind of special pointers, like GPU pointers or... If you have special pointers, you don't... Okay, so this is the question. If you have a pointer, for example, to shared memory, that works only with the C++11 model. If you're using the PMR model, we made the wise decision that people who use allocators today are the 1%. The people who use special custom proxy pointers are the 1% of the 1%. Let's not do that. Let's make the right engineering trade-off here and say those people are at the 99.8 percentile. They can go do their own stuff or we'll commission a group of people to facilitate them that's in parallel with this because this is the large population, relatively speaking, compared to those. And that really is custom stuff. You'll need custom containers that deal with those kinds of pointers. So they're in the private jet. Yeah, exactly. They're in the private jet. Exactly. <laughs> Love it. All right. So you mean that all that you did is for raw pointers? What I did is for memory that lives in the virtual address space of your processor, not other things, not other processors. Right? That's what I'm talking about. Did you have a point? Oh, yeah. Like I think the demonstration that it was on the top of raw pointers wasn't to say that it's not compatible with smart pointers. It's simply to say that. You don't need smart pointers. Right. Smart, if, you had to, if you had to destroy a system using shared pointers and you had to try to deal with that, two things would go wrong. One of them, if you have cycles, it might not go away. No, no, I'm not talking about smart pointers. I'm talking about fancy pointers. Okay, so the fancy pointers is different than the smart pointers. The smart pointers, it works just fine, but they're slow. It does not work with fancy pointers. That's, that is the idea. I think everything you said actually works with fancy pointers. It does in C++11. It doesn't in PMR. That's because you're thinking of the containers in C++11, but you can design the containers Absolutely, you could. So the point is, yes, you absolutely can, and you should, if you have enough of a client base to make it worthwhile. Yes. But one thing you're gonna, and we've talked about this, but one thing you're gonna run into if you try to mix, uh, like to make a variant of PMR that uses fancy pointers, is the standard PMR polymorphic allocator contains within itself a pointer to a memory resource. What kind of pointer? Is it a fancy pointer or a regular pointer? Right, that we don't want to get back to the C++11 interoperability issue, yes? I, I think the, the core problem is that PMR is effectively a type erased uh, allocator handle, right? And fancy pointers with type eraser are just going to be slow. I, I, the, 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 I just heard something about type erased and I'm not, a, I'm not I don't know. It's absolutely not type erased. The, the, whole, the whole thing is... It's not type erased because when you go to the container to get the pointer out, you get the base class. You need to have that thing. If you're saying that the derived class isn't available, of course not because you're dealing with plain old object-oriented programming where you have the, the base class thing. It's not that it's type erased. Type erased is a specific issue that we do with, 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 with shared pointer, right? Because we have a template, we create this thing inside internally, it does that. We have a factory for a constructor method. That's a very specific thing. What we really want to do, the idea is we pass in an allocator that is of type base class allocator, but it's a drive and it holds onto it. And when somebody says, can I have your allocator? You give it back and you have the allocator. You don't have to be a template. I think that's more to the point. Does that make sense? Did I, or did I not cover it? Uh, I think we're talking about the same thing. Just different Fair enough. All right. All righty then. Um, so C++11 really was a necessary step, but it, but it hurt. The C++ 98 allocators didn't work at all. Um, C++ 03 created reasonable words that still didn't work at all. C++ 11 allocators created all kinds of pain, um, but they, again, they were a necessary step. Um, C++ 17 allocators are much better. Runtime polymorphic, much easier to write and use. So we're making progress. We don't want the type of the allocator to invade the type of the container. We want that to be kept separate. If that's what you mean by type erased, we're all good. I said type erased allocator, not type erased object specific allocators. Right? Like, but, yeah. if, but if yeah. the term type erased allocator means that you create a derived class and then hold on to it by its base class, I don't buy that as oh, type no, erased. That's not at all what I meant. It's, okay. It's like the, the object that uses the PMR allocator does not care about the actual implement, what, what the implementation of it is. Right? That is correct. But we're not talking about types. <laughs> okay. It's just a term that, that gets used. Okay. People invent reasons for not liking allocators. 
Uh, I'm just going to talk about some of the reasons that people talk about. We may not get through all this, but I'll try. Uh, these are reasons why people might not like allocators. Now, I say reasons, but there are reasons in quotes because um, I don't believe any of this. Not any of it. Not at all. This is all hype. So let's talk about it. Advances in global memory allocators have led to dramatic performance improvements, especially with respect to real-world multi-threaded applications. Wouldn't replacing the compiler supplied global uh, memory allocator with a newer state-of-the-art one achieve most, if not all, of the real benefits derived from assiduous use of local allocators dined into a program? Does that resonate with anybody? Does anybody say, yeah, yeah, that's it. So, <laughs> global allocators are not and cannot be sufficient. And the reason is that the general purpose allocators are ignorant of the application specific details. And that's it. And there's nothing we can do about that. There is no magic. So that has to be kept in mind. They cannot achieve the locality that, that local allocators can. Kind of obviously, right? They cannot provide the collateral benefits, clearly. Okay. Did I address that or do we need to go into that more? We're good, okay. For all but C++11 model AA objects one require maintaining extra state even for the most common cases, i.e. where the default allocator is used and two, necessarily employ virtual function dispatch when allocating and deallocating memory. Isn't that too inefficient for AA software to be viable in C++? This was the way of thinking for many years that how can you possibly have this inefficiency and yet, it's kind of weird. Would you buy a $100 bill for a penny? No, penny's too much, can't afford it. Nope. It's not. Relic is effectively a virtual call, like it's swappable, it's startup. But An allocate. It's not virtual, though. Yeah. It's like it's, it's it gets relocated at start time. Sure. But the compiler can't look into that, I think. That's yeah. What are you, what are you suggesting? Are you saying if you redefine the global allocator, that's not, I mean, it's. Like, there's no virtual call there. I want to talk about zero overhead with respect to PMR models. Um, there's really, it's not violated. The needed extra space can be addressed. Um, it can be used only upon allocation. It can be stored outside the footprint. It can be alighted in the common cases. These are all ways of dealing with it. So for example, if you're worried about using uh, an extra word, there are ways to not use an extra word, and there are certainly ways to not use an extra word in the footprint. But it turns out that we choose to use the extra word in the footprint. Can anybody think of an example where we deliberately make the size of an object bigger to make it faster? Yes? Okay, okay alignment. Anything else? Okay, but we have better ways now, which is densely populating cache lines. Anything else? String, string short string optimization. Right? What do we do? We make the footprint, we don't, we don't just use the existing footprint, we actually make it bigger. We take a footprint that might have otherwise been three or four words and we make it eight. Did you know that? Why do we do that? Now, do we use the full eight words of the string optimization or do we keep a couple of things outside of the buffer for quick access? Yes, we do. And in fact, both... Um, uh, Andre Alexandrescu and I, at the same time, I swear, we didn't even know each other at all at the time, uh, independently came up with this really cool idea where the last byte in the string would be a status code and, and it would work out that the, the length of the string would reach zero uh, because it would be the struct size minus the length of the string. So if the length of the string was exactly the struct size minus, if you follow what I'm saying, the null terminator was zero. We squeezed every last byte out of that buffer, and it's not as fast as not doing that because all of the computation and all of the noise that goes into making that work is more expensive than just accessing the thing directly. So it's a really cool idea that when you benchmark, it doesn't work. So even though there are a lot of ways to do better here, it turns out that we don't do that and we get better results. The other one is the virtual function dispatch can be compiled out in the cases where it's important. Understand again, if you have a, 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 a concrete derived class that's an allocator and you have a template 
that's following it, you pass the address of the derived class into the template, the com client compiler sees all the code and you're done. Does that make sense? It's the same code in many cases, it's the same code today. GCC had a head start about three years ago over Clang. Who knows where we are now, but now that it's part of the C17 standard, I guarantee people will work on the problem and it will be the de-virtualization will become normal and fine. This is not really an overhead, but even if it were, it pales in comparison to the benefit we get from locality. You couldn't even possibly measure it in almost all cases. So all of this zero overhead stuff needs to be forgotten forever. It's nonsense. Okay, we make trade-offs all the time. People make trade-offs in design, right? What, what, it's not a trade-off unless you trade something off. If it's a Pareto optimal improvement, we just do it, right? So we have things where we benefit uh, some with negligible cost to others. We have some benefits for a few and small cost to others. We have large benefits for expected case, but significant cost for others. These can get you fired. If you have something that works and you put one of these in and some important client's code stops working, you get fired. So we don't do that. And in fact, this is what we're doing with allocators. We're basically, we're, we're, we're robbing the rich to, to, to pay the poor, but we're taking a penny from the rich and we're giving the poor a whole lot. And even if they're a lot more rich than poor, the poor get really happy, sort of. That's a terrible analogy, but how about this? <laughs> Everyone must buy auto insurance, right? Everyone, whether you need it or not. Accidents are unusual, but not rare. So if we have allocator aware software infrastructure and it turns out you need it, it's there and the insurance cost is we paid the price for having it available in case you need it. So that's my analogy, okay. Uh, failure to properly annotate types or propagate allocators can undermine the effectiveness of the allocation strategy, can lead to memory leaks, especially when winking out memory, especially when winking out memory. Aren't the extensive verification testing and or peer review required to avoid such errors impracticable? What do you think? I mean, it's a concern. You're not a lunatic if you think that this is a lot of effort, because it is, there's effort. People who are not trained will try to do crazy stuff with allocators, they will. So you need to keep a leash on them. We need to explain to them what they can and can't do, what will and what won't work. By the way, contracts are a prime example where people can go to town and get that completely wrong and cause mayhem you start using contracts where you're really trying to validate input, you say, oh look, my program works and I turn off my contracts checking and now all of a sudden uh, I get some bad input. Well, the program was working so I turned off the checking. What? That happens. So this can happen with any feature so we have to be very clear. There are static tools that can help us with this. There's the test allocator to avoid leaks. There's this new thing that's gonna do it all for you which we're not gonna have time to talk about and so on. Um, so compatibility with the modern C++ style. C++ encourages a style of programming where objects are more often passed and returned by value, sometimes relying on our value references to move these objects efficiently, whereas BDE style, that's our style, relies on passing allocator aware objects by address as arguments to achieve optimal efficiency and control over the allocator employed. Isn't this old fashioned style unjustifiably restrictive? So here's the crazy thing. This old fashioned style gives you more flexibility and more performance. You can build on top of this style, any style you want, but not vice versa. The function level return an object by value style is slower in general, it's no faster. And I say that tongue in cheek because infinitesimally in some cases, what you're effectively doing is you're creating the object each time and then destroying it. If you need the object exactly once, it's more efficient to create it, use it and destroy it, than, than to create it in a default state, populate it, use it and destroy it. This is true, but the difference is typically almost unmeasurable. On the other hand, if you do something in a loop, like the accumulator pattern, which we're gonna talk about, I think it's gonna come up, then the difference in cost is dramatic and there's no way to fix it with allocators or anything um, because what you're doing is you force the issue of construction and destruction on each call of the function, and you don't need to do that. So that's what this is, the accumulator pattern, tokenizing, tokenizer returning strings, for example, 
is a classic example of where you do not want to return the token by value. I don't care if you move it, construct it in place, you know, whatever you do, that's forcing a construction and destruction on each call. That's bad. Doesn't give you full control over the resulting allocator. And think of the added complexity of trying to add an allocator for each method. Right now, all we need to do is add the, the uh, allocators pretty much for the constructors. Now imagine if every method that returned an object also had to have an allocator parameter and it doesn't work because you still have to construct it and destruct it. So now you see how that just is completely uh, uh, overwhelms any kind of sensibility. So this really doesn't affect it at all. What we want to do is we want to be able to build our low-level infra infrastructure so that everyone can use it and then we'll, we'll create a special case for those people that want to use it uh, in a special way. So I am about out of time. I went over, of course, didn't do it last time. But you guys ask good questions. Move versus allocate, we sort of already talked about. Uh, move assignment is often not as efficient as coffee. We've done a, a copy. We've done a number of benchmarks. We know when this is the case. Uh, Mux with memory, I talked about uh, cache lines. Um, constructive interference, this is also known as true sharing. I made up the term, true sharing, because we want the, the prefetch. Um, pre the, the, the not prefetch, but, but getting uh, uh, data that we're going to need soon just by the locality. The prefetch is because of the order of access. And then there's this optimal n-way cache that was discussed and main memory banks that was discussed and we're not going to worry about that because that's too low level. And then moving within a container as we discussed earlier, thank goodness, is okay. Uh, it preserves one and two above three and four, not so much, but we're not going to care. Uh, the last one is object pools and factories serve to reduce overhead caused by allocating memory. So why aren't those other approaches as good, if not better, alternatives to allocators. And the interesting thing is those are higher level abstractions. Memory allocation is reduced but not obviated. And uh, do moving vans eliminate the need for furniture companies? Uh, whatever that means. No, the, the idea is um, they're not replacements. In fact, if we were going to build uh, object pools, we'd build them out of memory pools. We would have lower level infrastructure and then we would have these object pools. Uh, so they're different levels of abstraction and I'm just going to put this up there for people to read. <sighs> all of our object pools, of course, should be AA once we build them on top of memory pools that are AA. So this all fits together. It's not one versus the other. It's just different levels of abstraction. By the way, object pools are exactly what we're doing when we're using the accumulator pattern or something else like that. We're creating an object and we're reusing it. And that's a good thing. Um, this way we enjoy the collateral benefits, discussion, questions, and I guess I need to get to the conclusion. Allocator, allocator aware software infrastructure is uh, uh, custom allocator strategies impact performance, uh, implementation, object placement, historically required bespoke data structures, long delivery time, any collateral benefits cost extra, no reuse. So a, uh, allocator aware software infrastructure has real costs, uh, fixed engineering costs for software uh, and uh, infrastructure developers, uh, added operational costs for people using it. Um, there's resistance to the C++11 style allocators and there should be. And investing in an AASI is an economic decision. Uh, it provides nearly the same runtime performance, lower incremental costs used more often, requires substantial upfront costs, comes with important collateral benefits, C++11, uh, C++11 experience caused concerns and fear, uncertainty and doubt which is understandable. Uh, do the benefits outweigh the cost? So this is what you're supposed to take away and decide. Here's a picture, and remember that these are the incremental benefits. Uh, or th this is the incremental cost saving, and these are the incremental benefits. These people are doing it for altruistic reasons. They don't really need to do it. These people are doing it for very selfish reasons. They need that performance. So this is really the conclusion, and then of course I have to say, wait, but what if? What if we could get rid of the costs entirely so there were no costs, or essentially no costs? What if that just went away? Then what would you say? And should Bloomberg invest in allocator with software infrastructure? The answer is how can we afford not to? The benefits outweigh the costs now we claim, and once we get rid of the costs, then all we're left with the benefits, and then it seems like it's analogous to self-driving cars because the cost of having a self-driving car versus the cost of not having a self-driving car is about the same. And so reduces client use cost to bare minimum. There's no extra documentation. There are no additional uh, parameters. Everything works just the same way seamlessly with every feature in C++. 
And uh, it'll be a lot like the way we use virtual functions today. We don't have to create a table of, of pointers. We just say virtual and we're done. Imagine if allocator use were like that, and then we had this thing without the, the effort, any of the effort. And then that's the talk. OK. All righty, sir. Is there a bias maybe towards the, the large code reuse model that happened to exist at Bloomberg, where in other situations, the idea of having like a compile time choice of which allocator will be like statically built into a library, would, you be, would that be much more acceptable? OK, so the question is, the question that was asked is, um, is Bloomberg biased because it deals with large scale software development? And the answer well, is, in some sense, in the same address space. In the, <laughs> in the same process, I think yeah. you're talking about. It doesn't matter what the process is because we're not talking about programs. We're talking about libraries. Libraries are not per program. If you, if you were in an environment where building a, a separate flavor of a library that uses a custom purpose allocator statically, uh, where that is not prohibitively expensive, so, what would it, what would it, so I think the question, the question is, anything that's in the small, you could pretty much do what you want. You could use any language. You could do pretty, you could use Python, you could whatever. But once things create, get beyond a certain size and a certain number of individuals cooperating, whether it's a single program, a single address space, or whatever, it doesn't scale well. And so the, the C++11 style, for everybody I've ever spoken to ever, who's ever written anything, hates it. So I think that speaks for itself. Now, PMR not so much. PMR actually scales. And having something that, that, that is PMR based, but does the plumbing for you, scales more better. So that's my answer. It's, it's not just Bloomberg. It's anybody who's ever written code, in my opinion. Yes? Yes. Okay, the question is, is virtual functions for allocators the only legitimate use? Absolutely not. Um, if you look at how, in the standard, so how do, how do shared pointers work? They use type erasure and those involve virtual functions. Just an example. Okay. By the way, <laughs> object-oriented programming using virtual functions and, and that kind of thing is not a bad thing. It needs to be used when it's appropriate. Templates in and of themselves are not a bad thing. They can be used when they're appropriate. They're two different sides of the coin, right? You don't always use templates. You don't always use virtual functions. You use them when they make sense. Yes, but I think there's two different because if you read, the, let's say, CDB reference of R, yeah. you will never see any documentation of any virtual function in there. Like, well, you know, you, so the point is, the point is there, you know, there's a swing, right? Originally, we didn't have, we had procedural languages, and then object-oriented became the rage back when I was a young man. And then templates came in, and oh my goodness, look what we can do. And they became the range, and now there's, they, they bite you sometimes. And so we're going back to PMR, because PMR doesn't have the drawbacks. You see, it's a pendulum. It goes back and forth, and people overuse something, like the stock market goes up, and then it goes, oh my goodness, then it goes down, right? I mean, there's a... Absolutely. I mean, think about the decoupling you get when you have large systems, right? You have lateral interfaces. You can do them with templates, but then they're, they're strongly bound in. And to do anything, you have to recompile everything. Whereas if you have, if you have uh, virtual functions, you don't need to recompile your code. Code can exist in a library already ready to go without modules, without anything. And you can just plug it in and it just works. There are cases. I'm sure. I'm sure we have other cases. Don't we have them in some of the some of the more recent stuff? With, the, with well, yeah, I was going to say standard function is also anything that, that we call type erase today is using virtual functions. I O streams. Well, I O yeah, but I O streams are, are yeah. All right. But yes, I don't think we should. I don't think we should say that virtual functions. I don't think we should say that virtual functions are a bad thing. I just want to be clear. They should be used appropriately. Yes, they have a place. They, they, found a, they had a place a long time ago. They still have a place. <laughs> yes, sir. So, uh, the places within Google where we use custom allocators, mm -hmm. the biggest problem is people want to 
one x four screen inside of their custom allocated memory, and then as soon as they do that, they they either well, they, you generally basically you've got a string that you can't use with a whole bunch of library functions because all those library functions are built on using the std string. So you end up having to copy the string in order to use the function or. You know, so what kind of string do they use? So they, they, have, they have a string, they want to use allocators, but they, they want, I'm, not, I'm not quite following. If you have any allocator where a string, you can't call a very large number of standard library functions because they take a std string. Right, okay, so here is a general problem. There's a general problem. It's just a small little problem. It's kind of like what people want to do. Where everybody should just immediately convert to modules and everything will be fine. What we need to do, for real, is we need to think about what is our interface type. Now, iterators are used for interfaces because they don't, we don't care about the type. We care about the element type. We don't care about the, the container type. But ideally, if we were going to deal with string, which is a, a perfect example of something that is a template that I sure wish weren't, but, if, but it is. If we could create something where the standard vocabulary type for strings does include the polymorphic model, I mean, even if nothing else did, that would be a huge win. If the string in turn weren't a template, even better. Yes? So string view overloads for those same standard library functions would also solve this problem. Yes. But to his point, how do you get around that today? And the string view is a great when we're dealing with read only and right. strings and, and allocators. The problem is like, I have this string in the allocator and I want to append like five bytes to it. Right. But I don't I don't think that the, the string view helps us when we're trying to mutate as well, right? That's also yeah, a problem. It's not in the mutation case, that's right. Right. So what I'm hoping for is a miracle. It's like at some point we will decide that the, 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 the general community will decide, you know what? We don't really need the C++11 style nearly as much as we need the PMR style because the PMR style is actually useful and the 11 style isn't. So at some point, some brave soul, some company, somebody will say, I'm going to release my stuff and I'm going to use the PMR version. And as soon as that happens and other people catch on, then this will all work again. Unfortunately, until that happens, we have a uh, impedance mismatch, and that's unfortunate. It was a bad idea to begin with that we need to overcome. It's a, it's a hurdle. It's a pain point. What can I say? If we had, by the way, if we had a language extension that just made this all go away, that would be nice too, right? So that, that might be the only real cure, right? Just like make it go away. All right, well, I think I've kept you 10 minutes late, so I appreciate your coming. Thank you very much.